talent. I'm Juan Carlos Vera. I've been teaching classical guitar at Miami Day College for the last 27 years. Upon hearing a recording by my special guest, this belief follows. While a gentle shaking of the head may be inevitable, the most sublime expression of the classical guitar has struck you. Whether you're a member of the exclusive Grammy voting committee or someone glued to the seat of a car anxiously awaiting the credits of what you can't believe you're hearing, David Russell will be the name. Walking away with every major guitar trophy at international competitions during his youth, including the Andres Segovia, Francisco Tarrega, and Jose Ramirez awards, David Russell became a name to be reckoned with. Guitarists will recall that Andres Segovia astonished the English composer John Duarte by producing his unique brand of sound on Duarte's own guitar. But be aware, David Russell is himself on any guitar. His style is Segovia-like and unlike at the same time, hard to pin down. But if chefs taste, David Russell hears. And in the myriad ways in which things interconnect, his sound is buttery with hints of nutmeg, cloves, and lightly splashed Spanish Jerez brandy. Of him, the New York Times hailed, Mr. Russell possesses a talent of extraordinary dimension after his inaugural 1981 New York appearance. It's a great pleasure to welcome for a full hour one of the great guitarists in the world and Grammy Award winner, David Russell is the name. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. You just got off a, a plane uh, not long ago, a few minutes ago, so thank you for the effort. My pleasure. It's nice to be here. Now, uh, first things first, uh, Celta de Vigo, Deportivo de la Coruña, or Celtic of Glasgow? Celta de Vigo, <laughs> <laughs> very much so, because that's my city. Your city, uh, you follow uh, the Liga, the, uh, the first uh, division of Spain? Yeah, my wife is a card holder. Or and I, I don't have a season ticket, but I go very often. If, I, if I'm at home, yes, of course, I, I love it. And Celta is doing pretty well. They're doing well, yeah. We're sort of worried once in a while, but we are, we're doing well. The, uh, you also uh, used to play golf. You still play golf? I still play when I get a chance, yeah. But, you know, when I'm on tour, it's not possible. But when I'm home, yeah, of course. Any effect uh, on your hands? No, well, in fact, that's why I started playing golf instead of tennis. Because tennis is a little bit heavy on the right hand. I'm right-handed. And if I play a lot of tennis, then I can't practice so much. I remember Paulo Casals saying how strange it was to play the cello after having played tennis, because he did play tennis. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you also may be uh, well, one of the only few guitarists to have run marathons. You used to run oh, every year. <laughs> well, my wife and I have run marathons for, well, we've done 10 of them. And we run one a year. Do you still do? Yeah, yeah, we're down for one in, I think it's November, October, November. Slow marathons, you say. We're very slow, yeah, we, we don't try to, but mind you, the last one I made my record, but it doesn't really matter. There's always going to be faster people. So it's not really a matter of being really fast. It's just the whole challenge that's You're exciting. also uh, into the outdoors, a botanist. You're interested in plants and... Well, I, especially I like photography. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I like to go out and enjoy whatever the world will offer. It's a beautiful world. Talking about the, uh, your beginnings, uh, born in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, but moved to uh, Minorca, Spain, because both parents were artists, painters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my father passed away, unfortunately, but my mother, she's, she's getting on, but she still paints. She still paints. And she's amazing. What style? Uh, both of them were very different, but both of them were, I suppose you could call it post-impressionistic. So mm -hmm. you, you recognize what you're looking at. But my mum, in her later life, uh, has become much more adventurous and mm -hmm. her, her art has a lot of fantasy in it. Beautiful color, mm -hmm. and, and wonderful. And initially, Minorga offered a lot of uh, landscape. Uh, in fact, that's why they went mm -hmm. there, because yes. um, my father was teaching art in a school in Scotland and you know, after having studied art at, at art school, etc., they wanted to be they wanted to be artists rather than just kind of be stuck in the mist of Scotland, which is also very beautiful. Mm -hmm. But so, first of all, we went to the south of France, and then we ended up in Menorca, and so we lived there. And all the rest of my brothers and sisters were born, etc. And there, you started playing uh, the guitar at age six. Well, uh, I think I actually probably started before that. Before that, yeah. And uh, initially uh, taught by your father, how did that go? Mm -hmm. Well, that's really why I wanted to play guitar, because I could see that my father in the evenings would 
pick the guitar up and play. He played classical, not very well, but he loved it a lot. And he would sit down with a glass of wine and play some music, and it was a nice time to be together. So he taught me, but I think he started teaching me when I was three or two. I don't really remember. It's a magical thing when you see your dad uh, pick up a guitar and play. Yeah. The, uh, you also played violin and French horn. Well, that was more when I wanted to study music, because at that time, it wasn't very easy to get into a major institution, a college like in London, as a guitarist, because they only accepted one a year, more or less. Things have changed. The whole mm -hmm. guitar world has just become so much more developed and better. But at that time, I did the audition to get in as a French hornist. Mm -hmm. But they accepted me as a guitarist and a French hornist. Yeah, that's an experience that few guitarists have. Did it uh, contribute? to your uh, guitar playing, the uh, French horn especially, playing with the uh, orchestra and... Uh I think the violin more, because I, I played the violin in, in... I mean, I was the back of the seconds, I wasn't that very good, but I was good enough to play in good works. You know, a guitarist normally you don't get mm -hmm. to sit and play a Beethoven symphony or a Mozart symphony, so that experience was fantastic. I don't know if it really helped me in my guitar playing, but it certainly mm -hmm. helped me in my music. Uh, don violin and uh, guitar uh, repel each other by being so different and similar at the same time? Well, there, there are many things that you can actually relate. You know, all, everything to do with vibrato, tone production and things that they have, you can apply in some ways to our, uh, to our playing, to the guitar playing. So yeah, it, I think it was a great experience. Then you studied uh, with Jose Tomas, uh, one of Andres Segovia's main assistants. You said uh, he taught you clearly and concisely. What did he teach you? He, he had a very organized way of thinking. And so his approach to how to resolve problems, both technically and musically, was to uncomplicate it. <laughs> Get rid of the complication, make it, make it simple. It's sim so at least the first idea is simple. Whereas as a young player, I had way too many ideas and doing way too many start things to the music and possibly way too many complicated fingerings. He said, no, 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 you can play something very beautifully without doing all these fancy fingerings. And so I think that what the first thing I learned from him was make it simple first. And then later in the concert, you may complicate it. But that part was really good. Technically, he was fantastic and he had a wonderful tone. So when you sat in front of him and he would demonstrate a little phrase and it sounded just like this beautiful, beautiful, warm, big sound that he used. And it was just an inspiration. And he didn't really say, oh, change your nail or do this. So that the details were up to me. Mm -hmm. But the inspiration came from the did way you he learned did it. by watching a lot? Observing? Watching and listening. Yeah. Because each of us are built so differently that a technique that might be good for one person is not necessarily going to be the right technique for another person, especially in the right hand. So really, just to achieve his balance in tone and the, his use of tone was more listening to him, and that was an inspiration. You had a good relation with him? You got oh, along very, with him? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he passed away some years ago, very sadly, but uh, yeah, of course, we were friends since, since I was 20 years old when I started with him. And my wife went to study with him as well after, you know, so yeah. Very good. The, uh, the, then you proceeded to uh, win the three most prestigious guitar competitions in the world. Were you surprised by that? Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> I mean, now there are many, many more competitions, but uh, 40 years ago there weren't so many. And so, you know, I, I went in for the competitions without really knowing what my standard was in comparison to others which is a problem often when you're a young player. You know so, uh, whether you're better or worse than some of the people around you, but the rest of the world, you don't really see what's happening. So in the competitions, I made lots of friends and found out that, yeah, I, I could play well enough. And also I was lucky enough to play well on the day, which is very important. You know. Did uh, Jose Tomas encourage you in the, uh, into entry competition? Did he anticipate, uh, did he see, uh, um, did he visualize what you would be able to accomplish? I, I think Jose Tomas was not so keen on the whole idea of competitions. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Segovia also was not very keen on it. You know, competitions are its a strange thing because we're doing an art which has to be judged. So then it depends on which judges are on in the jury. It's also a, a kind of depends how well you play that day. So if the jury knows you, maybe they maybe undervalue or overvalue your ability 
depending on whether they what they think you came up to your own standard apart from just comparing directly so it's such a subjective thing that I can understand that some people feel competitions have no place in music but they've existed in music forever yeah. I mean centuries ago and it's one of the ways for young people to in, uh, well to force their practice to encourage their practice so if they have a competition it's a bit like an exam if you like even if they don't win they really get to push their own ability <laughs> because yeah it's uh, it's quite difficult it's a lot of pressure when you're going for a competition and you made a living from the winnings uh, of those who <laughs> are well well <laughs> you know when you're a young player and you come out of college you finish your your studies how what do you live from well giving guitar lessons and things you know as I was teaching guitar for 40 hours to little kids in schools in London and there was hardly any time for me to practice from you know get home I mean not all the kids want to learn you know when you teach in a school and so sometimes it's a little bit demoralizing so you put all your effort and all that inspiration to get them inspired and then in some, ways, in some ways, that inspiration should be for yourself yes. if you really want to get. I was reading a letter, a letter by Beethoven to Czerny, Czerny, the famous piano uh, yes. uh, a comp a teacher, uh, and he, Beethoven wanted him to play on a concert, and Czerny told him, look, I, I can't. I, I, I'm, work, I'm teaching 12 hours every day, yeah. seven days a week. I'm not ready. And Be Beethoven understood. Uh, the, in terms of the uh, competition, getting back to that, the, uh, because a lot of players who win uh, are forgotten, but you managed to use your competitions as a springboard uh, yeah. to start your career. You know, I think nowadays if you win one or two competitions, it, it doesn't suddenly put you in the world scene, on the, in the guitar scene, but it's better than not winning them. <laughs> so uh, I would say... Or, that or unless you're Manuel Barbaco, because... <laughs> You know the, the story about him finishing second. That was the Toronto one, I believe. Yes, yeah, exactly. But well, because everybody saw how good, he, how well he plays, you know, and and so in some ways that was it wasn't to his detriment to yeah. not win. It was okay. And sometimes I didn't win every one I went in for. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I came second as well. And it's, it's you know the great thing is that the money that I got from winning meant that I didn't have to teach for six or eight months. So yeah, yeah, it was worth it. Talking about concerts, uh, you're performing in Miami tomorrow as we speak. Any special repertoire that uh, you're excited about uh, that you'll be bringing uh, to this concert? I have two pieces that I'm really happy to play here. I have a new piece written by Sergio Assad from the Assad, yes. Assad duo. And Sergio has written some pieces for me before. But he wrote, uh, some years ago, he wrote a piece called Ellie's Portrait, yes. which is a piece based on Ellie's name, Ellie Kastner and I performed that one. Then he wrote another one called Sandy's Portrait, yes. which I've also played based on Sandy Bolton's name. Now he's written one that's called David's Portrait. <laughs> so it's, it's mine, uh, it's of my name, mm -hmm. and it includes my father's name and my mum's name, and also my wife, Maria Jesus, her name is there. So he's uh, made a kind of fantasy out of the themes that come from Reminiscent of the uh, great uh, Edward uh, Elgar, the English composer, right. uh, the Enigma Variations, so. in which uh, even a dog <laughs> <laughs> is included. <laughs> the, uh, the talking about concerts, do, do uh, different concerts require a different level of uh, preparation? I suppose they shouldn't. But if you you know if you're going to do a, a major debut in a big city or something like that, then beca just because you feel the pressure, there may not be more pressure, but you feel more pressure. Perhaps you have to practice it more. But I would say I, I want to be just as well prepared if I'm going to play in a small village in the middle of Spain as if I'm going to play here or wherever else. You say it, it helps the cause when someone plays uh, well anywhere. Absolutely. You know, I was lucky and uh, probably most of us could tell a story of having played in some unknown little place and there's someone in the audience that helps you get forward in your career. So I played in this little place in the north of Hungary once and there was a producer from the BBC and he was there and he just said, he came up to me and said, I'm booking you for, B for the BBC straight away. So I played, I played on the BBC every couple of months from then on. So that Luckily, I played well in this little town in the north of Hungary. And, uh, and I'm thinking of the, uh, there's a performance, you could say a concert of yours uh, done by Spanish radio television, which is on YouTube, the, uh, 
uh, these days. Uh, how did that come about? Uh, a, a person phoned up and said he, they, he wanted to make, originally it was going to be a series of concerts, but I believe that, that maybe things didn't go, work out, so mine was made. And so I went to El Escorial, which is a, a big palace. Yeah. Um, and near El Escorial, there's a small palace where the prince was going to live and perhaps did live, and it's really beautiful. Wonderful acoustics and things. So basically I, I played, it, it was not long after I'd made a, a record of Latin American, a CD of Latin American music. So I had that, uh, that repertoire and so the whole program is Latin American music. Is it particularly challenging to record or play uh, for television? Yeah, yeah, because it's about, well that's not completely live, but each piece is uncut. So, you know, when you play live, things, things on the screen kind of like stand out more than in a concert because people's attention is different. So yes, it's perhaps a little more difficult to play for TV, but yeah, if you're well prepared, then you do it, it's okay. Is there a dominant fear before a uh, performance, uh, memory, fingers, making a fool of yourself? Well, yeah, I mean, there's lots of fears. <laughs> Probably everyone goes through different kinds of fear or stage fright at different times. But, you know, I'm fairly lucky that it doesn't really scare me too much. I mean, there are much worse things in the world and people have much bigger challenges. So, you know, you, 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 you're not in mortal danger. It's just your ego that <laughs> is in danger, you know, if you make a mess of something. So really, the, the, I think the whole idea is to be really well prepared and then also you can't go from never playing and you don't play for six months and then suddenly play for a TV program. You, you can't do that. You have to go through a process of playing your pieces of music for people, for friends, for family, and then finally put it into concert. With concerts, the, um, you've said that uh, the circus atmosphere or the high wire act uh, atmosphere in concert, it doesn't really particularly, it, it doesn't, uh, that type of thing doesn't attract you. Is there such a mentality in concerts that people... Well, I think, you know, the, the, a lot of concerts, some concerts, let's say not many, but some young players tend to show their technical ability, which is perhaps the circus side, rather than their expressive or musical ability. And I think maybe as people get older, they maybe value more the expression and the, the artistic side. But there are young players who play really artistically and really beautifully. So it's not everybody. It's just some go more for the flash than for, for the beauty. But still, it doesn't matter. It's okay. I probably did it when I was 20, you know. Who cares? Do you find being uh, in front of an audience uh, addictive? I think maybe, maybe the, uh, the excitement of playing your concert and when things go well, the excitement of, I won't say just the, the applause, but the excitement of that situation is something that I would miss if it was taken out of my life. I would probably end up having to look for other sort of challenges that gave me something like that excitement. You know, I don't need to go and risk my life climbing, climbing mountains or, do, or riding motorbikes really fast because, you know, every week or so if I play a concert, I feel like I'm risking my life. And so the challenge gives enormous satisfaction as it, when it goes well, you know, and hopefully it's going to go well always. But the challenge, the, the, um, the size of the challenge is equivalent to the size of the satisfaction, right? So that's really why some people feel that it's addictive. And that's why Segovia played until he died, because he didn't want to stop. He could have stopped years before he stopped, but he enjoyed that situation. And me too. You remember he said that his bones would shake before a performance, and at the end of the performance he wanted to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> right. And now we're going to uh, listen to the great David Russell in performance, and we'll come back in a moment.
story at MDC. Be analytical. Be imaginative. Be a rising star. Be bold. Be connected. Be the solution. Be ready. What's your story? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back. I'm Juan Carlos Vera. We're joined by one of the great guitar players in the world, David Russell. Talking a little bit about uh, appearance and, and wardrobe, uh, David, you, you don't mind appearing in shorts on YouTube videos. Uh, can you imagine Segovia doing it? Well, things have changed. You know, <laughs> it's, there was a time when perhaps like Segovia, etc., was very conscious of uh, being the grandmaster. But the whole period of the grandmasters, it's over, you know. And so nowadays we're, we're more normal. But I still dress well for my concerts. I don't <laughs> go into my concerts in shorts. But YouTube is, a, is another world where, I mean, those, some of the little YouTube things I've done, it's, it's, it's in my studio and I'm just playing pieces for, and sometimes I did them purely for myself. And then you put them up because people ask for them or whatever. So it's not really, I don't really want to uh, come out like I don't care. You know, in the YouTube, yes, but in the concerts, I, I want to present myself well. Are you comfortable course. with the formal attire uh, of concerts? Well, even that has changed because, for example, you mentioned the, the recording that I did <coughs> uh, at El Escorial in Spain it was quite a while ago. I'm wearing this huge uh, bow tie. I mean, it's completely out of fashion now, but it was 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And at that time, most of my concerts I played with a dinner jacket and this huge big bow tie because it was kind of like the fashion. Now I, I just, I go like this, more or less. Sometimes I wear the jacket and things. But pr the presentation is partly, you are saying what you want to say with your clothes. You are saying to the audience, okay, I respect you or I don't. It depends what you want. And for, okay, you've got long hair, I have long hair. I can't cut it anymore because <laughs> all the photos have long hair. So if I chopped it all off, be a new situation. Uh, what about the long hair? Was that a, an image decision or a personal? Uh? When I was a kid, I always had long hair. My, my grandfather was a barber uh, in Glasgow. And every time I visited him, he'd want to cut all my hair off again. <laughs> so it was a, there's an element of rebellion, if you like, when you're yeah. 15 or 16. And my parents said, you leave it as you like. And then it just, that's the way it stayed. So It was in fashion in Spain at the, uh, the time also. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I tell you what, the presentation I think is important. The other day I listened to this uh, wonderful group of young young guitarists, uh, like in, in a school, mm -hmm. like high school, right? And they weren't super super guitarists, but they played some pieces for me very nicely, and things. And one of the things they they could have improved, and they did immediately, is said, "Your presentation is not good. Like it's got bits of paper falling down. Uh, this one looking that way. This one uh, no." no when they did it with better presentation, it was suddenly better. I don't say the playing was necessarily better, but what we do is so subjective, that is, you are trying to entice the audience into your, your music, so your presentation is also part of it. Some people talk, some people don't. So that it's not that you have, everybody has to do it the same, but you have to do something that charms the audience so that they yes. enjoy your music. Yes. But and the way you present yourself on stage is important. Were you seen as flamboyant and did it help you? Not so? particularly, I think. There are, there are many more more flamboyant people than me. You were never the uh, bad boy of uh, classical guitar? No, I don't <laughs> think so. No, no. The, uh, but you're not high brows either. You don't put airs uh, common in classical music. Uh. Well, you know, our world is perhaps slightly different, say, from the opera world or whatever. And most of the classical guitar audience is slightly different. We kind of cross that border and many people who maybe play country music and like some jazz or that might go to a classical guitar concert. They may not go to the opera, but they might come to ours. So our, our audience is quite broad, really. And I think maybe our presentation or our way of being has to be for the people who love going to hear, say, a piano recital of all Beethoven and the people who maybe like to go and hear a jazz concert or something. Everybody can enjoy our thing if we do it right and we present it right. The uh, talking about style and sound, 
Are you better defined by your style than your repertoire? I think both. You know, we use repertoire to to mark our style. And if you feel that you play certain kinds of pieces quite well, then you're going to cho choose that repertoire. And if you feel that you don't play this repertoire very well, I'm going to leave it for other people. Why is it difficult to identify with a particular type of uh, repertoire? Well, some people, for example, don't like to play transcriptions. And so there are some comp uh, guitarists who only will play pieces that were written for the instrument. That's their choice. I, I love playing transcriptions because I wouldn't like to spend my whole life without playing a piece by Bach or a piece by Albéniz. <laughs> you know, so I'm happy to do transcriptions. Some people don't like to play Baroque music, for example, because maybe they either they don't live it very well or they don't like it or they don't enjoy it. That's fine. S some people don't like to play super contemporary music. For example, I, I don't play many super contemporary atonal pieces now because I feel that other people do it better than me. But I play many pieces that are written now by composers and friends, like, for example, Sergio's piece and things. Um, every, every concert, I have one or two pieces that are written more or less now, and I enjoy doing that. Is there a piece that defines you? No, no, no one piece, no one piece, of course. How are you able to uh, transcend from guitar playing into art, a phenomenon uh, so obvious to anyone who observes you? I don't know. <laughs> Everything about you is so artistic, the, with your hands, the way you move, uh, the everything resonates art. You are going beyond the uh, guitar playing. How do you do it? Well, I don't know how you do it, but you know, if you feel like expressing what you enjoy in a piece of music, and you feel like transmitting that and sharing it with other people, I think you have a chance of doing it. If you don't feel that, like you want to share your ideas or your, or your enthusiasm for a piece of music, then if you don't feel you want to share it, it's going to be quite hard for the audience to perceive your feeling. I, I feel that I, I enjoy this piece of music so much that I want you to enjoy it just as much. And so my challenge in the piece of music is for you to feel the same kind of enthusiasm or joy or pleasure or excitement or whatever you want to put on it. So that is what I try and do. But there's a physical beauty associated with it that you bring to the table that uh, is not there uh, in other players. The, uh, well, I think each of, us, each of us offer a character that we, we can't really change our own character. So other players hopefully will find something else in the same piece of music because it's the con connection between this piece of music and this player and this person in the audience. And that, if that works, there is some magic. If it doesn't, if one of them is broken, like if the player doesn't like the piece but he's playing it, maybe not a good idea. Or if the audience doesn't like the piece the person and the player does, maybe the player has to help the audience enjoy it. You know? it's, e each person is going to make a different, a different musical moment out of the same piece. When did you find your uh voice as a guitarist. You talk about Barroco finding him, finding it young. And how would you describe your voice as a guitarist? Well, Manuel was really a child prodigy. Manuel, when he was young, he could play the Chacon before he was 13 or, you know, things like that. I wasn't a child prodigy. I, mean, I really learned much later. And although I played since I was two or three years old, it took me a long time to, to raise my technical level. Uh, I used to, I, I learned from my father, who is not a musician, and we learned with Andres Segovia records, and we tried to like, struggle to get the notes by ear and things. So really, I didn't go through uh, the right process, uh, and I wish I had, because it would have saved some time, but now I don't really care, because it it's went well. But it could have gone badly, because like at the age of 18 or so, I could hardly sight read at all. I mean, it just had, there were so many gaps in my education. Nowadays, the young students usually have much, much more educa general education, music education, by the age of 18, 19, 20, you know, than I got. But I learned it later, that it didn't matter. I've heard Pepe Romero, I don't know if he's changed his views on this, he used to say that uh, you should not learn to read music until you are an advanced player on the guitar. Well, that's, Possible. I mean, I, I, you know, sometimes <coughs> when something is said out of context, I'm worried that Pepe would might not 
agree with that now. You know, as you get older, you have to read more <laughs> because you want to play more PCs and that. So if your sight reading is not very good, you really have you have to practice so many hours to learn a piece. Whereas you know, if you, it's, you can just read it. What is David Russell's uh, unique contribution to the guitar? I, I don't know. Other people can judge that for, for me. <laughs> Do you happen to uh, identify uh, with uh, two-string ornamentation, for example, uh, in an almost personal way, you took that to new heights? Okay, so, so is that going to be my, <laughs> my identity, my signature? It's going to be the trill, the, the fourth. The no, other people did that well It is unforgettable the, when, the, when you hear it. I, I enjoy it very much, and it was something, especially in the Baroque music, that I heard Ida Presti in her recordings play the trills on two strings. I thought, wow, that's great. That's because sometimes in Baroque music, you come to the cadence, and we do our trill, and if it happens to be in 3-4, it really sounds weak. And yet, when that same piece is on the harpsichord, that moment is the loudest moment because there are more notes. You know? And the, r the feeling of tension and resolution is much greater because their trill is much better than ours, our traditional trill. Yes. So if you do it on two strings, you can get that power and tension in a cadence. And then the little ornaments, just little passing things. <coughs> in the Baroque music, the keyboard music, anyway, uh, the two string uh, ornament, I think, elevates the music closer to what, say, Bach would have heard. Uh, in his time. It would be different if it's something, say, from the violin music or that, but I think once you transcribe it onto the guitar, we want to make it more, well, guitaristic and more close to what the harpsichord does, because we don't, we can't play like the violin, which continually plays a note. Our note, we pluck it and it dies from then on. So our music production is completely different from what you do on the violin or the flute, etc. So I think our closest cousin is the harpsichord. And I learned a lot from listening to them and stealing their ideas in terms of ornamentation. Stravinsky, the guitar sounds not small, but uh, from afar, poetic or accurate? Uh, <laughs> both, I suppose. I mean, it depends how you see it. I think, you know, nowadays everything is so loud. Uh, that our instrument has it's got a little louder perhaps than a, a guitar from the 19th century, but it's not much louder in terms of decibels. So we are now competing with cars honking and blast, you know, amplification, etc. So our instrument, in some ways, has relatively got <laughs> quieter, and people are not used to paying attention and the silence necessary to really enjoy the classical guitar. Yes. But that's up to the performer to hopefully entice the audience and, it, and in invite them to tune down and to listen to us. And uh, has the uh, microphone helped some yeah. players and hurt others? I don't know if it's hurt others, but uh, it's helped all of us in, in times when we either play with an orchestra or when we play in a bad hall that may be too big or something, use the amplification. I didn't used to like it 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, because usually because it was bad. Nowadays there's really good amplification systems that's quite, quite small, you don't need a hu huge lot. I have a really nice little box, I don't carry it around, I don't usually use it, but a good mic and a good box and you can boost your volume if it's necessary. And you record uh, in a church or hall uh, uh, mm. s uh, talking about that point, is, is it wise to uh, avoid the uh, dry walls of a recording studio in terms of the sound that uh, That's you're looking for? Yeah, it's a choice that I think each, each player may have to do. Uh, you see, I feel that I play better in a hall that has good acoustics uh, because you, you use the acoustic to spread out your, your notes, to, you know, the, the, it lengthens the note. And when you play in a dry hall in a, or a dry studio, the note only rings as long as the string rings. You, you don't get the help of the hall, the, the amplification, if you like, that the hall gives you. So then what, what tends to be done is that then electronically, from your dry note, they create exactly. the hall, right? But, but it but doesn't inspire you as well, you were playing. I'm not in control yes, of it. Yes. The, the electronics is in control of it. So I, I prefer to give a problem to my technician and say the technician 
to record in a good hall is a problem yes. for them because yes. uh, there's extra noise coming in, outside noise, they, because the microphones have to be further away, and it's a problem for them to capture the beauty of, say, this hall. So my engineer, that I made 15 CDs with him, uh, Tom Knapp, unfortunately he passed away, but Tom's a fantastic guy, and I made a whole lot of CDs in Baltimore, um, actually about three or four miles away from Manuel Barueco's mm -hmm. house. It's a beautiful hall and uh, Tom Knapp, the engineer, was able to capture the beauty of that hall. I think I loved it. Yeah. And uh, we're going to listen again to uh, David Russell uh, with another great performance uh, and we'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Be a hero. Be the solution. Be connected. Be innovative. Be global. Be successful. Be you. Be MDC. Be Miami Dade College. talent. I'm Juan Carlos Vera. We're joined by great guitar player David Russell and one of the 
great guitar players in the world. Uh, Aide Latino, Grammy winner for the best soloist instrumental uh, performance, competing against the likes of uh, Plednev, Ashkenazi. Uh, you thought you didn't have a chance, uh, but you, sh you and your wife, Maria Jesus, uh, showed up anyway. Well, you know, Maria is much more adventurous. My wife is, uh, she said, you know, okay, you got a nomination, we're gonna go anyway, just for the party. And just to, you know, so we got really well dressed. She had a beautiful dress and I had a nice, nice new suit and things. And we went there really without any hope. In fact, I didn't prepare a speech or anything. And um, my, the producer from Telarc, the night before he said to Maria, David has a chance, more of a chance than you think. So I got nervous there, but I really didn't think it was gonna, be for me but it was so I, I, I was sat in the front row with uh, with a guy who was nominated for um, American ethnic music uh, North American uh, and uh, so we shared we had okay I said if I win you take photos and thing and if you win I'll mm -hmm. take photos I think he got a, a Grammy as well so anyway then suddenly my name came up and that was it it was fantastic a wonderful wonderful experience I'm really glad we went you uh see that uh, recording that album uh, in a special uh, light after yeah of course part, partly because of that but also you know everything just came together for that album in in a sense that um the the sound was great the the packaging I everything just was extra good uh, i mean the others are fine as well but that one just had something a little bit extra and that's maybe why it was nominated oh you understand that uh the, uh, due to all of this popularity, uh, there was uh, an avenue in Menorca, Spain, named after you. <laughs> nice place for a guitar <laughs> shop. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I, you know, I grew up in a tiny little village of 800 people, and so of course everybody knows me, and I know everybody there. And when they made a new street, they they gave it my name, which is usually, you know, you have to wait until you're dead before you get a street. <laughs> <laughs> so it was fantastic, you know, wonderful. I'm very proud. That's why sometimes I put it in the CV because they yes. made me, first of all, adopted son of the town. Yes. And then and when I go back there, it's marvelous. Everyone is very friendly. And I love it. Talking about recordings, um, you got any new projects or uh, recordings that uh, you're working at the moment? Yeah, in fact, in a couple of weeks' time, I'll be right. recording, and I'm going to do three of Sergio's pieces, a piece by Steve Goss called Cantigas de Santiago, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful piece, which I'm going to add to the program tomorrow. It's not on the program, but I'm going to add it because I love it. And another piece by Matt Dunn called Landmarks. M Matt is a composer from, well, he lives in Texas, and he wrote a piece for me last year. It was really beautiful. How about your own stuff? Or, uh, you feel uh, you have something to say as a composer? I think I have more to say as a player than a composer. I'm not, I'm not very good. I mean, I'm, a I'm an arranger, so I I'm, I'm happy to arrange many, many pieces, uh, and, and I enjoy doing that. And in the Scottish Celtic music, that's probably the closest I ever came to really comp playing my own composition, because I wrote my own variations. But I'm not up there for that. Talking about uh, technique, um, how did you start playing diagonally on the right hand? It wasn't Jose Tomas, uh, was no, it? No, no. I, I studied at the Royal Academy in London with a man called Hector Quine, and it wasn't Hector either. Uh, it's just, I was just looking for ways to get, to get the sound to work, and I ended up playing more and more diagonally, probably at some point too, too much, because I had a very bright guitar, and uh, so my whole idea was you take a bright guitar and how to make it warm. Or now I have a very warm guitar, so I have to try to make it bright if necessary. But I use a lot of angle. But then the angle changes, you know, so it gives you a variety of sounds without having to go down to the bridge and up to the sound hole. You can change the sound just by changing the angle a little yes. bit. And so, yeah. And you say that sometimes you even change guitars depending on the repertoire. Yes, I've done that a lot. Yes. You can't do that on tour. Yes. <laughs> you know, you're stuck. <laughs> when, when you're on tour, you're, you're going to be Not two, two months. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, are flamenco guitar is uh, better developed in scales, tremolo slurs, more than your typical uh, classical playing? Well, I think <laughs> perhaps, you know, if you can't play fast scales, in, uh, you're not going to get anywhere in the flamenco. Whereas in the classical guitar, you don't need to be the super fast, although some repertoire will be not in your 
uh, you, won't, you won't be up for that, say, Aranjuez, etc. You know, these pieces, you have to play fast. But there is a large repertoire in the classical world, classical music, that doesn't require super speed. Yeah. You can deal with 80 or 90 percent of the repertoire if you can play four notes at 120. <laughs> so you put the 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 click 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 taka 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 taka. You got to get close yes. to that. Yes. Whereas, you know, Paco Lucia is another dimension. Those guys could play so fast. And what do you think about Paco de Lucia's father making him practice 10 hours a day? Well, my father made me practice, <laughs> but he, I think, in some ways, uh, discipline comes from comes from your family if you like and I, I don't mean discipline in the bad sense I suppose because sometimes you say well, you're gonna uh, be, be uh, rough behavior, to you, behave yes. you know no discipline is learning my father used to teach uh, sorry teach paint uh, eight hours a day and his, his saying was if the angel comes to guide my elbow he said I hope the angel finds me painting and not drinking. <laughs> you know, so, you see, if, if you want to get better at something, you have to put the effort in. And he did and make you practice. Well, he made me practice. I, I, we went to Scotland and I said, I do not want to go to school. Because, you know, I'd gone, I was going to school in Spain. And then when you go to school in, in another country, it's really kind of traumatic for, for a young boy. And I, I was really, I'd done it once. I hated the idea of being with, in a school where I didn't know anything about what they were talking about. So he said, okay, but if you practice, you could do homeschooling, right? So we went there for six months because my youngest brother was being born and I practiced like a crazy guy. And I went from being able to play a couple of little sore minuets to suddenly being able to play a bar suite. Well, maybe not, not, maybe not very well, but those six months where he said, you practice because you're not going to school. And it made a big difference to my life. You know, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting well, here You were talking. doing many hours a day. Well, at that time, I had no friends, so I'd basically just play guitar all day and then read the, read the school books in the evening. The, uh, it's interesting, Paco Lucia says that everybody congratulated him on how fast he played, and he said, this would not have been possible if my father had not done what he did. Uh, right. we, we know that that's not popular these days, that type of... Uh, but, you know, I sometimes think, why is it that, uh, say, some of the some of the young players that are coming out often come from uh, countries that are really quite difficult? You know, like for example, in Europe, there were quite a few that came f uh, good good young players that came from Yugoslavia, or now it's split up, but at that time Yugoslavia. It was a really difficult country, so the kids maybe there's not too much TV, no video games, and, uh, and so if they are really good at guitar playing, why they go forward? Which natural abil abilities uh, did you identify as your strengths technically from an early age? Or even I, was, I was fast but messy. <laughs> and it took me a long time to realize that I really had to clean up my act and not play so messy. And so I really worked very hard at all the basic technique, more or less when I was on and off studying with Jose Tomas. You know, seeing. John Williams once gave a little course and I, I was able to sit in front of him, he, well, I played for him, and, and he just took my guitar and said, no, you should do it like this. And I thought, wow, it was just so good. And so it suddenly kind of just, you know, okay, I really need to get to another level. And it, it was to do with purely with technique, uh, yes. that I needed to clean up my technical act. Because originally I, was, I could play really fast, I could learn things easy, but it, it, was, it was not good. Do you disdain of uh, talking about technique, or do you enjoy uh, technical detail enough to talk about it? Oh, I love it. I love it. I mean, really, you know, the the more technically able you are, the more musical you can be, because anything that is musical is is actually more challenging to play something with a shape than to just bang out the notes. So you can you can be a click 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 type of player, and you ask that player to then put some good shape into it and take care of the, the say give beauty to the, those notes. And Suddenly, it's much more difficult technically. So you need the technique. Absolutely, there's no way you can get away with it. Talking about practice, are you still a proponent of the piano bench for obvious reasons uh, when practicing? Well, it's just that when you travel, uh, you're going to sit on usually on a piano bench when you when you play in a concert you know they don't have a, a huge uh, array of chairs to choose from so you want to have at home something that's kind of similar to what you're going to find when you go to play in a concert hall 
But but what other sort of bench would you think of? I mean, just like a well, normal comfort, seat. right? Comfort. Uh, there are players who've had uh, uh, injuries. So oh yeah. The, uh, right. Just from the point of view of, of uh, comfort, there's yeah, is there any other thing that you could use? Uh, other well, than a pillow or. Uh, yeah, I, well, I use the, yeah. the, the, the footstool. Yeah. I, I've tried yeah. the, the knee pad and the other things. But I, I grew up using a yeah. footstool. So, but th it is true that nowadays, I think if I was going to start again, I might use something that holds the guitar up without having the knee to come up. Because as you get older, you know, your back goes out and that sort of thing. So, but I just encourage everyone to keep, keep fit. Yeah. So if you're <laughs> fit, then your back will be okay. But sit well, you know. We, if you sit kind of all hunched up, yeah, back back operations are not uh, strange to, to uh, some guitar players. No. The uh, talking in general, uh, which is worse, to listen only to music of the past or only to music of the present? I suppose we should do both. Uh, you know, it's a, the thing is, uh, when we say the music of the present, there's a lot of different things. You know, that could be classical music yes. that's being written now, or it could be. Uh, the rock music and things. I don't listen to, to the rock music or what, the, what, what is going on, yet most people do. That's what they hear. But I'm a classical musician, and you know, if you look into the past, there's a lot of music to look at. So it's quite easy to spend a whole week just listening to Bach and just talking about Bach. It's really easy. It's not so easy to spend a whole week comp on one composer that is alive just now. It's not so easy. So I would prefer to be omnivorous, mm -hmm. guitaristically omnivorous or musically omnivorous. Which player, note for note, uh, has the, great, the greatest uh, interpretational content, in your opinion? Uh, on the guitar? Yes. Uh, it's, it's really hard, that, you know, because once you know people as friends, if you like them, you start to like their music. And if you don't like them, even if they're geniuses, maybe you don't like their music. <laughs> You know, so I love listening to my friends, although I always get nervous in their concerts. Yes, you do. And uh, yeah, well, I get nervous for them because yes. I, I, if I like them, I want them to have a big success. And you know, so, but I love it when I see a friend really playing beautifully. You know, it's, it's more impacting, it's more emotional mm -hmm. than if you he hear somebody you don't know and they yeah. play beautifully, well, fantastic, that's great. How do established guitarists deal with the proliferation of young prodigies coming out left and right these days? Well, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. You know, it's, it, there was a time when the when the guitar was kind of like the, the poor the poor brother of the Royal Academy, or you know, we were the worst in our general knowledge. Now, when you go to a university or something, the guitarists know as much as the pianists or as much as the violinists. You know, so the guitarists are not left behind because, because there are enough virtuosos, but also the general knowledge in music and things is so much better than before. So I see it as something absolutely fa fabulous. It will be difficult for them to break through. Who is going to be the next person that's going to be playing lots of concerts? But it was difficult for us as well. And then you hear when Julie Bream talked about his struggle it was also difficult for those people. And then Segovia talked about his struggle. It's never been easy, so it's yes. not going to be easy the next 10 years. But if everybody is playing at this high, high level, of course there are going to be some people that will be also not only technically able, but will be wonderful to listen to in their artistry. What will you teach a seven-year-old? We have a lot of kids in this program, uh, program you know, young players. What will you teach a seven-year-old? I would, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard, apart from just the technique. I, I would hopefully inspire them to want to learn the technique as well as enjoy the music. So the teacher has to choose the right pieces that keeps the enthusiasm of that student. And so if you can teach them the enthusiasm, or like you are enthusiastic about the guitar, so if you are enthusiastic, they will be as well, mostly. So transmit your enthusiasm, and they'll fix up the technique if they really go forward. Well, David, it's been a pleasure, real pleasure having you. Thank you so much for uh, coming in. We'd love to have you again in the future. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been great to have you here. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, tuning in, and uh, we'll be back soon with another uh, episode of Our Talent. I'm Juan Carlos Vera.